Good morning, everyone. <coughs> so it is uh, our great pleasure to introduce uh, Vasile Kuchov. He um, did his chemistry studies uh, at UPLFL in Switzerland, where he also got his PhD, uh, working on theoretical tools to better understand photochemical reactions. And then he carried out uh, a couple of postdocs, the first one at Stanford University in USA and the second one at the Max Planck Institute in Halle, Germany. Then he moved to Bristol with Amalia Skolodowska uh, Fellowship, where he um, worked with uh, experimentalists. And then in 2017, um, he created his group in chemistry um, um, in physical photochemistry at Durham uh, University. In uh, 2018, he got um, an ERC starting grant, and um, um, three, year, three years later, he was promoted as an um, associate professor in chemistry. And uh, I think this uh, present year is, has been a very good uh, year for, for Basile. He was appointed as an uh, associate professor in um, theoretical chemistry at the University of uh, Bristol. And he was also the recipient of um, a couple of awards, the Royal Society of Chemistry Manlo Award and the PCCP American um, Investigator Lectureship. Um, his main interest are the development and the application of theoretical tools for um, studying uh, molecular dynamics in the electronic excited state. And as I said, it's a great pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Ines, and thank you everyone all for having me here. So, I don't know still if I want to do that or that. I think maybe that. I hope that you can see. So, how does that work, please? Oh my god, okay. <laughs> I will try. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so I'm super pleased to be uh, to be with you today. So, and so I have, uh, I mean, you have received the slides. I have quite a few slides to try to kind of talk a bit about this method called, called full and ab initio multiple spawning. So the idea here is to try to simulate the dynamics of a molecule when you forget about the bond of an MR approximation. Okay, so when formally, you can have your molecule that will visit different electronic states. So I will try to kind of give you a sort of overview of why we should care about that or why we may want to care about that. And then just where then the equations are coming from when we start to derive this methodology. And I will then introduce this full and initial multiple spawning. But my goal really is to try to kind of take you through the different steps. The slides sometimes have quite a lot of text because I wanted them to kind of be self-explanatory in case you just want to come back to them and it's not just a picture or something like that. But I don't really care how much material I cover here, right? I, it's not really, I don't want to kind of rush to the end. What really matters is that at least you get the main picture, the main ID of this method, and you can perhaps then contrast it with the lecture from Christina on quantum dynamics and the one from Jesus later on in the week on surface hopping. So if you have any question during this lecture, shout. Okay, I mean, no worries. I mean, not too loud for your neighbor falling asleep, maybe, but I mean, just, just feel free to really interact and ask any question that you may have, right? I will also try to kind of do some very short break, like, like just two, three minutes break from time to time, just to try to recover a bit of the brain cells, right, uh, over the path. But um, yeah, so really the idea here is to kind of try to give you an idea of what this full multiple spawning is, but without really like, like just to get the gist, right? So that you can, you feel comfortable with this, okay? So 
I think you got the slides. I also provided a few references uh, related to this topic. Uh, and we will, of course, discuss that a bit more during the, the, the tutorial session this afternoon. OK? So let's get started. Let's get started. <laughs> let's not get started. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it is maybe because it doesn't get the uh, PDF thingy. Uh, all the I have a standard one. Uh, wait, I think it's more like that. Um... I just started. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, it's just that. Yeah, I think. Yes, it's on Slack. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so as I told you, I mean, so the goal here is to just give you a, a broad idea of what exercise dynamics is. I will discuss this main equation, which is the time dependent Schrodinger equation for a molecular system, right? For both the electrons and the nuclei and time. Then I will show you how we can actually solve this equation by using the concept of traveling Gaussian functions and how this will drive us to the full and the initial multiple spawning. And then I will show you some applications of that to molecular system. Okay. But uh, as I mentioned to you, I mean, there are, so these slides are based on, on, on the chemical review and a book chapter. Um, you have both of them. So in case if you need to have some of the words that go around the slide and the topics that I mentioned here, you can just dig into that. Um, and maybe just to get started is why do we care about this? non adiabatic dynamics and also what, what does it mean in the first place so if you look at a molecular system okay and you plot here electronic energy <laughs> electronic energy versus on the uh, on this x axis here like any form of nuclear coordinate nuclear displacement stretch or torsion or something like that you can draw this potential energy curve the electronic energy as a function of the nuclear coordinate okay so you have here, I will, okay, I will try to do that better. So you have here the ground electronic states, the first electronic excited state, second, third, and so on, and so on, and so on. And in 1927, what Born and Oppenheimer proposed is the fact that to a very good approximation, if you are focusing the region here of, say, the ground state potential energy surface that is far away in terms of energy from any other electronic state, you can neglect the coupling between nuclear motion and electronic motion. What does that mean? Well, it means that formally you can only focus on one electronic state. The electrons are always going to remain in this electronic state, whichever nuclear displacement you do. Okay? We really make the electron to stick to this electronic state, which is brilliant. That's the birth of quantum chemistry. Lots of methods can be developed with the focus here of these ground electronic states. But we can wonder what happens then if we are interested in these processes, where a molecule now is in an excited state. Because very likely, we will reach this region here, where electronic states will come close in energy. When, you, when these electronic states come close in energy, the nuclear motion may be sufficient to trigger a transfer from the molecule from one electronic state to the other. This is called a non-adiabatic process. This is the non von oppenheimer effect that I was mentioning before. Okay, and in this particular case, the von oppenheimer approximation you will simply break down. Why do we care? So when when do we have this kind of situation? Well, all further chemistry is only about that. Okay, when you do a further chemical reactions and nowadays applied for the chemistry in organic synthesis, for example, is a really big developing field. Also, like simply solar cell and organic electronic in atmospheric chemistry, when there's sun next to organic molecules in the atmosphere, for example, light interaction in biological system, the fact that your brain now see this little dot moving around is just a cascade of a photochemical process triggering a cascade, biological cascade in your eyes, signaling that there's something going on mediated by photons. And also a lot of recent development in spectroscopy being in tempo and attosecond spectroscopy where experimentalists are actually nowadays able to kind of do look at molecular movies, looking at the geometry of molecule moving like on the femtosecond time scale, which means that it's a very nice challenge for us to try to kind of do the same thing, right? 
So also, maybe my favorite example of a non von Oppenheimer effect, this is what you see here, is a long time exposure photography of fireflies, these little glowing bugs, right? So you can see these beautiful traces, right? Because you have these bugs emitting lights. But what is kind of important to realize is that this chemiluminescence that you see here, if you were to live in a world where the von Oppenheimer approximation would be always correct, this is what it will look like, okay? You will just switch off the poor fireflies in this context. And this is really just a good, a good, like a, a good vision of this uh, von Oppenheimer approximation of this von Oppenheimer effect in real life. Okay, so if anything, let's do that for the fireflies and try to kind of make them recover their glow. So more generally, what is the picture we want to depict? So what we would like to be able to do for a molecular system is the following little scheme. So you have your molecule here in its ground vibrational and electronic states. And what we want to do is a little experiment where we come with a pulse of light, we excite this molecule into say the first excited state, then this molecule here, when it will be in this state, is no more in its in an eigenstate. It's no more in a stationary state. What was a stationary state here in the ground state now should be defined as a nuclear wave packet. A wave packet is no more a stationary state and is something that actually is out of equilibrium and has a certain associated dynamics. And in this particular case here, this wave packet will relax here and can reach this region that we defined before as being places where you have a breakdown of the von Oppenheimer approximation. And this nuclear wave packet here can just split, right? In other words, your molecule will be at the same time on the ground and on the excited states, right? And this is really a non von Oppenheimer process. This is what I would like to be able to simulate for any molecule, okay? However, when I show you this little plot, it looks very simple, but what I'm actually telling you when I show you this little <coughs> graphic is that I would like to be able to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation here for a molecular system. If you focus on this wave function here, this is a molecular wave function where you have electrons, nuclei, and time. And you may already know that just for the electronic part, we suffer a lot. Quantum chemistry is a very difficult field to get the, electron, the electronic part of the Schrodinger equation right. So now I'm coming and saying, oh, I want to add time, I want to add all the nuclei. This is definitely going to be something we need to approximate. Okay, so what we do usually, and I'm going to come back in detail later on, is that we try to express this molecular wave function in terms of things that we know. And one of the most common way of doing that is to kind of do this ball among representation. And once more, I'm going to show you where it's coming from in a minute, right? I just would like to kind of stimulate a bit the curiosity here for this equation. But basically, the ball among representation. Here it tells you that we can represent this molecular wave function as a linear combination of electronic time independent wave function and nuclear time dependent wave function. And this is nothing but this representation that I showed you here, where you have the static potential energy surfaces on which the nuclear wave function are evolving. But more importantly, if you look at that here, at this equation, what you will see is all the problems associated in doing this kind of dynamics. First of all, we need to solve the electronic structure problem. We need to have electronic wave function. We need to have possibly how this, uh, this, uh, this state will drive nuclei, for example, via these forces here. But we need also to calculate some more exotic quantities. And this one will come back very often. It is called the non-adiabatic coupling vectors. Don't be, I mean, if you see some equation, I'm gonna try to kind of explain what they mean here. And in this particular case here, these non-adiabatic coupling vectors, what you can see is that it connects the electronic wave function for an electronic state I with the electronic wave function from a state J via here a nuclear displacement. Nuclear displacement connect different electronic states. This is the non von Oppenheimer term that we mentioned before. It's the one that is responsible for mediating this kind of transfer of your molecule from one electronic state to the other, right? But we need to find a way to calculate that. We need, for example, also to describe the environment the external field, or maybe a solvent that you may have around your molecule. And last but not least, the dynamics of the molecule, of the nuclei of the molecule, how to simulate that. Here in this plot, I show you this nuclear wave packet. In other words, I still consider my nuclear degrees of freedom as being quantum. But if I want to simulate molecules in their full dimensionality, 
I may have to kind of find some approximations there. Okay? So what I just would like you to keep in mind is that when we do this kind of business, we have to accept that we will do some approximation. And what we want to do at this point is mostly to kind of devise a strategy that is robust enough for us to be able to have a good idea of what could be the photochemistry of a molecule. We're not going to go extremely accurate in terms of the calculation. Christina with quantum dynamics will do it. But in our case, what we want to do is basically to kind of be able to have a good idea of what happens to the molecule when you shine light on it. Okay? That's the main idea. Now, let me just introduce some of the main equations that are like, if you want, the formal equations, the ones that, that we can derive exactly from some of the concepts that we know, and that will start, that will, that will be our starting point for, for the derivations. So, as I mentioned earlier, everything starts here with the time dependent Schrodinger equation for a molecular system. And this is really, I, I'm stressing this molecular here, which is really important to keep in mind that. It depends really on all the electrons. This is this small r code. It's all the coordinates of all the electrons wrapped together into a, into a vector. The same here for the nuclei. This is capital R is all the position of all the nuclei wrapped into a vector. And time. So the Hamiltonian that we have in this equation is the molecular Hamiltonian with all the kinetic terms for nuclei and electrons. And the interaction terms between these particles, right? And it's given here where you have the kinetic energy term for the nuclei, the kinetic energy term here for the electrons, electron-electron repulsion, electron-nuclei interaction, nuclei-nuclei <coughs> repulsion. Very often, we take these set last terms here and we group them as being an electronic Hamiltonian. So it means that this molecular Hamiltonian is basically everything that goes for the electron plus the kinetic energy term for the nuclei, okay? But just for you to kind of keep that in mind, here we have all the information about our molecular system. Does that make sense to hear? Awesome. So now the wave function, well, the wave function is really a pain, right? Because this wave function now really depends on the electrons, on the nuclei, and that's gonna be a very, very complex subject. So as always, when we have a complex subject, we try to express it in terms of things that we may know, or at least we try to find a way to represent it in a simpler way, okay? So there are different ways to actually look at this molecular wave function. Actually, like two main ones that people are working on currently. 99.9% .9 of the time, you look at the so-called von Wang representation. As I mentioned to you, I'm gonna come back into the detail but where you basically try to express this molecular wave function using the idea of a lot of electronic states. That's the main idea. In the exact factorization picture, what you do instead is to say, well, I don't really care about the concept of a given electronic state. I just care about the electronic wave function. And you express then the molecular wave function as a single product of a time-dependent electronic wave function and a time-dependent nuclear wave function. This is quite fun. It leads to a lot of things that are changing our perspective to photochemistry. I'm not going to go into detail here because this is really one of the main, like, if you want support for understanding these kind of processes. So I'm going to go a bit more into details here. So the idea of the von Wang representation is as follows. If you take a molecule, right, and you just freeze this nuclei for a second, a bit more, but you just kind of keep one nuclear configuration. One R position. What you can do for this nuclear position is to kind of calculate the electronic wave function and the electronic energy thanks to an equation that you may know quite well, which is this <coughs> time independent Schrodinger equation for the electrons. That's quantum chemistry, right? In quantum chemistry, you take a molecule, right? You have one geometry, you calculate its electronic energies and its, see, density, wave function, or whatever, right, if you do DFT. That's what you're doing. Then if you do a geometry optimization, you will use this information to move your molecule around towards the minimum. Here's the same thing. We just say for one nuclear configuration, we can calculate the electronic wave function, the electronic energy. But then if, say, I move a tiny bit my nuclear position, and a tiny bit, and a tiny bit, I can calculate electronic energies and electronic wave function for any possible nuclear configuration. Do you agree? So basically, if I, were, if, if, if I were able 
this dream. We are in dream world here, right? But if I could here solve this equation for all possible electronic states, capital J, and for all possible nuclear configurations that I can generate for my molecule, I will have a full characterization of my molecule in terms of its electronic wave function and electronic energy, right? Which means that I can use the electronic wave function information as a basis to express my molecular wave function. We love doing that in chemistry, right? We have something that we don't know. So we take something that we know and we use it as a basis, right? Molecular orbital, we use atomic orbital as a basis. Same idea here. We have a molecular wave function. It depends on electrons and nuclei. Well, we know the electronic wave function from this here. So why not expressing this molecular wave function in a basis here? You see, this is my basis function, my electronic states here. And I sum them up over all possible electronic states. So the infinite on top of that tells you that okay, that's dream world, right? But well, and here, this chi that you have in front that depends on nuclear position and time can be seen as a sort of coefficient. We will call it nuclear wave function. But you can see that as a coefficient giving you the importance of each electronic state to represent this molecular wave function. Do you see that? Makes some sort of sense? Yeah? OK. So now the, the thing is that this gives us a way to represent this molecular wave function in terms of an infinite summation here of this product, electronic time independent wave function times a nuclear time dependent wave function here. So when we have a new toy like that, we want to kind of play with it, right? And one cool way of playing with this is to kind of take this expression here, we put it in the Schrodinger equation, in the time dependent Schrodinger equation that we saw before. I'm not going to do the math, but basically if you shake it a bit, right, what you will obtain after a tiny bit of algebra, and it doesn't take much time, right? Um, what you obtain is basically a sort of new version of the time dependent Schrodinger equation here, which is now for this chi coefficient, for this nuclear wave function. Okay? That's the only part in the born one representation that depends on time. So now you have an equation of motion for the nuclear wave function that depends on the kinetic energy term. The electronic energy that is seen as a potential on which the nuclei will slide, plus something disgusting that we'll talk in a second. Okay? So, what is really important to realize here at this point is that this E here, this equation is for one of these nuclear wave functions. The nuclear wave function associates, associated to the electronic state capital I. Now, it means that we have exactly the same equation for chi j k and so on and so on. So one of these functions for each nuclear wave function on each electronic state. And they are all coupled together, as you can see here, because this term here depends on all the other chi chains. So we replace the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So this, uh, whoops, we, we replace, ah, it's too far. OK, there we go. Uh, we replace this equation here for the full molecular wave function by something that now looks like that. But what it tells you here is that we have now some nuclear wave function evolving on potential energy surfaces. And this term that you have here is the term that will basically transfer amplitudes, nuclear amplitude, from one electronic state to the other. As you can see here, is a term that depends on two different electronic states, i and j. What you see here is basically our vision of photochemistry. When I showed you this plot earlier, it is basic, if I, if I can draw this plot, it's because the born wrong representation tells me that a molecular wave function can be seen in this way. It can be seen as these nuclear wave functions that you have here, so that's my chi here, evolving on this potential energy surface with associated kinetic energy, that's this part of the term here, and then it can basically interact with nuclear wave functions that are on the other state, or if you want, transfer amplitude on the other state. And this is done via this term here that depends on nuclear wave function on another state. OK? So all this picture that you have here is just basically representing this equation that you have here. Now, these coefficients that you have here are 
quite nasty. At least they look quite nasty. Let me show you how they look like. Do we agree? Uh, but basically, if you just focus a second, and I'm also talking to the pointer at the moment, yeah. So on this part here, you may remember what I mentioned before as being the non adiabatic coupling vectors. So these terms that couple electronic wave function J to electronic wave function I via a nuclear displacement. Here you have the same type of terms, but now related to the second derivative. So this is called the non adiabatic coupling vector, and this is called the second order non adiabatic coupling. And these terms are responsible for telling how the motion of the nuclei can alter, if you want, the electronic state in which a molecule is evolving, or how, if you want, amplitudes on one electronic state can be transferred to another electronic state due to the nuclear motion. Okay? And you can see that they are all stuck here, and they are the one responsible for coupling chi j, so the nuclear wave function on a different state, with chi i. If chi i is the only nuclear wave function that that is available at a certain time, say you excite your molecule, you start on the first excited state, this will evolve until you enter in a region where this C terms here becomes important and will transfer amplitude from chi i to chi j. Okay, so that's the sink and source term for the equation. Now, what is kind of interesting here is the fact that if you don't include this term here, well, you basically cannot describe photochemistry, or at least the relaxation between different electronic states. Why? Let's consider that we remove the Cij term. Okay, I just remove them completely. I neglect them. I said, ha, they're small. Well, what you have here is actually the true definition of the adiabatic von Oppenheimer approximation. Why? By removing these C terms, the equation that I have here now is an equation only for chi i. There is no more chi j here. There's only chi i. In other words, there's only my nuclei in one electronic state. I it can be the ground state, for example, right? And it is fixed there, and it is just evolving kinetic and potential term on i, but there's no way to escape, OK? Your molecule cannot go and visit another electronic state. No way. So this here, neglecting the Cij coefficients or, or, or terms, means that basically your molecule is now restricted to the ground state or another electronic state, right? But it cannot change electronic states. Do you see that? So this, if you want, neglecting this Cij, these coupling terms, is really a clean definition of the von Oppenheimer approximation. OK? So based on that now, we basically have two sets of equations that are of interest to us. We have a first equation, which will give us all the information about the electronic state, so the electronic wave functions and the potential energy surfaces or electronic energies here. And then we have this equation of motions for these nuclear amplitudes, but to kind of propagate, to kind of solve in time this equation that you have here, you need to know electronic energies, you need to know terms in this Cij that depend on the electrons, the neuromatic couplings, so you need to solve this equation together. So these two, if you want, are somehow coupled. We need information from one to solve the other. If you are focusing on ways to solve that, you're basically in the quantum chemistry world. Right? Finding ways of getting, say, information about excited states or like electronic properties in general, this is the, the job of quantum <laughs> chemistry. If you focus on this part here, you are mostly in the quantum dynamics world, right? Where you try to kind of move the nuclei using the work of our friend from quantum chemistry. So this lecture here will exclusively focus on this equation here. And the same for Christina's lecture and Hazus lecture how can we move the nuclear? Considering that someone is kind enough to provide me all the electronic information in advance. So I am not gonna talk about all the electronic structure for excited state here. I am just gonna focus on how can I move my nuclei around, okay? So what I propose is we do just uh, two minutes, really two minutes, I mean it, just little break, have a chat, just have a stand or whatever, just to kind of reactivate the brain just after this first uh, 25 minutes, okay? And then I'll, I'll restart in really just two minutes. Make sense? Okay? <laughs> <laughs>
question at this stage no okay so up to now what i just show you is basically the dream right we have this time dependent schrodinger equation that we can write nicely we have this bone one representation that we can write nicely and we can then derive a set of equations here so now what we're going to try to do is to see how we can actually approximate that or at least approach the problem of moving the nuclei of a molecule in a non von Oppenheimer context. Okay? So there are basically three main flavors to do that, right? And lucky you, you're going to taste all of these flavors during this week, right? So, <laughs> so the first one is to perform what's called as quantum dynamics. Okay? So, in, in a nutshell, in a very, very, like, uh, 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 briefly, the idea here is to take these nuclear wave functions, right? And for all of the nuclear coordinates, to basically define a grid. What I mean by grid is to say, oh, from say this bond length that goes from 0 0.5 angstrom to three angstrom, I will basically define a grid of points on which I will express my wave function, I will express my potentials. And I will do that for all possible coordinates and I will solve the Schrodinger equation that I described before on this grid. Okay? This is just a basic way. Of course, there are way more clever ways of doing that. Method like MTTDH that you will hear about that really are extremely efficient at doing that. Okay? But the idea here is to try to not remove anything from this equation. It's the dream, if you want. But it means that you need to define this grid, which, of course, will get bigger and bigger, as many coordinates as you have. Imagine if you just put 10 points for your grid, which is nothing. That's for one coordinate times 10 if you want to do another coordinate, times 10 if you want to do another coordinate. 
very rapidly you start to have a gigantic grip, right? Once more, there are very clever tricks to kind of deal with that, but it's quite important to keep in mind that this will get very rapidly quite expensive. But at the same time, what you have to keep in mind also is that this nuclear wave function, so that's this nuclear uh, sort of depiction of this nuclear amplitude, this one here, at the very beginning of the dynamics here, expressed on these little dots, which are the little grid points if you want. What is kind of important to realize is that this object here is it's quite delocalized. It's not just one trajectory. It's not just one point, right? It is, it is a real function, right? So when it will evolve over time, so this is this arrow that you see here, this here will change its shape, will take different shapes. It will be very, very complex to describe, right? So for example, at a later time, it may look like this shadow that you see here. So if you have a grid and you cover all the space where this wave function can go, that's a rather safe bet that you're not going to miss anything. But it will become very, very expensive if you want to look at molecules in their full dimensionality, right? In principle, for the most naive version of doing that, after five or six atoms, you start to really struggle, OK? So another way of doing that is to be very pragmatic and to say that this object that we have here, well, what we could do is to take a set of points that will be our trajectories, for example, and say that if I take a density of trajectories that mimics somehow the probability density of this wave function, right? And if I propagate that in time, maybe that's a good approximation to my nuclear wave function at little time. In other words, I look at how my wave function looks like at MT0. I sample a certain probability density of trajectories and I run these trajectories, and at later time, I look at how they are distributed, and I take that as an approximation of my nuclear wave packet. So this is a bit at the heart of the idea of surface hopping that Jesus will discuss, right? In surface hopping, you try to describe this object here with independent classical trajectories. So you take a ton of classical trajectories that you distribute like your nuclear wave function at time t0, and you hope that this swarm of trajectories over time will evolve as the nuclear <coughs> wave packet will evolve, which of course is an approximation, but that's one strategy of doing that. Why do you want to do that? Well, simply because we are very good at propagating trajectories. That's something we know how to do very well. Okay. So the other approach, which is the one that we really focus on, is once more to say that, oh, we have an object that we don't really know how to describe, the nuclear wave function, Let's use things that we know, Gaussian. I mean, in quantum chemistry, we've been using Gaussian forever, right? So why not express this nuclear wave function by a linear combination of Gaussian functions, OK? Multidimensional nuclear Gaussian basis functions, OK? Not for the electrons, really, for the nuclei here. So in this, part, in this case here, you would have, for example, these three Gaussians <laughs> here. And if I were to put Gaussian over all the space where my nuclear wave function would be, that would be a sort of grid, which would not really make me do many progress. But what I can do instead is to kind of say that this Gaussian can move over time. They're not fixed. They can actually move over time and try to follow where the nuclear wave function would go. In other words, you can picture that as a sort of grid of Gaussian function that will follow the nuclear wave function to make sure that they are always Gaussian where the nuclear wave function will go, a sort of moving grid. Okay? And this is a very, very powerful method that I will try to describe a bit more in, in details. But first of all, what are these trajectory basis functions, these Gaussian function? How are they defined? So once more, I apologize. This is the formal stuff. I will show you a picture after to show you what it means. So, but what we do here is to take this nuclear wave function on a given state i, and I write it down once more as an expansion, as a linear combination here of a multidimensional Gaussian function with a coefficient here that depends on time that gives me, that tells me how important this Gaussian is to describe my nuclear wave function, okay? So you see that this has a label i, 
And the Gaussian is a little i, in other words, I assign to each electronic state a certain number of these Gaussian. So if we have Gaussian functions, these Gaussian functions are characterized by the center of the Gaussian. So if you want where this Gaussian is located, where the maximum of the Gaussian is located, in position, but also in momenta, because this Gaussian will be moving around. We have also its width. And here, a little phase term, we're not going to bother too much about this one. So if you want to write this object, I mean, it looks disgusting, but this is just a shortcut for a multi-dimensional Gaussian, a 3n-dimensional Gaussian where n is your number of nuclei, right? Well, we can write that here as a product of one-dimensional Gaussian with an expression that is this one. So that's the general expression for a Gaussian, as you know, the exponential of the width times r minus r squared, and then a term that corresponds here to the momentum. But that's just a Gaussian, nothing more. So if you're like me, these kind of things, yeah, nice, the math, but I want to see it. So let's see it. So this is what you have here is a one dimensional Gaussian in x, okay? So it doesn't change with y, but it's just exponential of minus x squared here. I can show you the same thing for a Gaussian here in Y, okay? So if I take them together and I multiply them, boom, give me a Gaussian in two dimensions, right? Now, mentally, do that for three dimensions, easy, right? Okay, no, but you, but you see what I mean here, okay? <laughs> the idea is really that you can build this sort of object by multiplying this Gaussian one after the other, okay? So that's just what you're doing here. Of course, you will have tons of questions of how to do that properly and everything. But OK, this is the idea. We try to represent our nuclear wave function by a combination of this type of 3 and dimensional object. You with me? Cool. So let's go back to my friend, the born one representation. I really love this one, right? So, so here we have this born one representation, what I showed you before. And now we have a new toy, right? Because my KIJ, my nuclear wave functions here, can now be represented as a linear combination of multidimensional Gaussian functions, okay? Which is exactly what I did here. I just substituted here this sky j by a summation here of a certain number of this trajectory basis function for state j. And here, this is the coefficients, and this is this, these are these Gaussian functions here, okay? I just re express this. Now, these are just little notes, but just notes here that. The time dependence here in this, is in this coefficient here, okay? But what is also important here is that now we have a new way of expressing our molecular wave function. So as always, you take it, put it in the time dependence tuning equation, shake it a bit, and try to see what happens, what kind of equation of motions you obtain now for this coefficient here. So if you do this process, you obtain this new equation here, I'm going to discuss it in detail later on, okay? But at the moment, just keep in mind that this here is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. As always, the same one as the beginning. But now I just re express it in this basis of electronic states. That's why you have here this capital I and J's, that's the electronic states. And for the nuclei part, on, I mean, in a basis of moving. Gaussian functions. That's why it looks weird. But this is exactly like solving the time dependent Schrodinger equation. In the limit where we have a large number of Gaussian, there is no difference between that or solving the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Now, the only thing is the thing that depends on time that matters is this coefficient that tells you how important each Gaussian are, right? But nothing has changed. So at this point, and I'm going to come back to this equation later. Um, now, what is kind of important is that while I can cover my space in Gaussian, like I would do with grid points, what I can try to do now is to find a way to have this Gaussian function to always follow my nuclear wave function. In other words, to always be present in a region of configuration space where I need them, right? And this will be finding some ways of moving these Gaussians around such that they follow my nuclear wave function. And this will define three different families of methods. 
The first one is called the uh, variational multi-configuration and Gaussian. So it's developed by Graham Ward at uh, UCL in London, by Irene Burkhardt in Frankfurt, in Benjamin Lazorne in, in Montpellier. The idea here is that you will move this Gaussian based on some sort of quantum trajectories. Quantum trajectories are trajectories that are really following exactly the motion of the nuclear wave packet. It's a bit of a strange concept, if you want, but it's extremely powerful. You know that your Gaussian are always going to be like following your nuclear wave function here. So that's why I kind of draw that in, in, in the following way here. So you have these Gaussians here, and they, they, they sort of follow these sort of fuzzy little lines. They're all connected, all the Gaussians are knowing about each other. So it gives, if you want, a way to use really a minimum number of Gaussians, because this Gaussian will always know where to go to serve the nuclear wave function well. The problem is that the equations of motions can become very complex and also quite unstable. So it works extremely well, but it's quite challenging to make the propagation of this Gaussian. The other strategy developed by Dmitry Chalashin in Leeds is to use another type of trajectories to move these Gaussian. These trajectories are called iron phase trajectories. It's a sort of mixed quantum classical method. Maybe Jesus will mention that later on, but basically, this is a sort of way to follow where the, the, the centroid of the wave packet will go. And it works also quite nicely. It might become quite expensive in some cases because you need to also solve a sort of strange electronic wave function at the same time. But it's a rather efficient method if you want to describe short-term dynamics for electronic states that are rather similar. Now, the method of interest for today uh, the full multiple spawning that was developed by Todd Martinez in the 90s, where the idea here is to be very pragmatic and to say, well, these Gaussian are just going to follow classical trajectories. Okay, why not? So it's an approximation, of course, because we know that a wave function like quantum mechanics is not really the same thing as classical mechanics. However, it's a very, very efficient way of moving your Gaussian. You just make them evolve along classical trajectories. But now I just would like to raise one thing, is that if you do that, but if you still have a lot of this Gaussian, as this Gaussian are just a basis to express our nuclear wave function, even if they move classically, if you have enough of them, they will still offer a proper basis to solve exactly the Schrodinger equation. So if I say we move this Gaussian classically, it doesn't mean that you actually are doing an approximation per se. You will just most likely need more of this Gaussian function to make sure that they cover the space of interest. But if you have a large number of Gaussian function, you don't care if they move classically with quantum trajectories or with errant phase trajectories. They will all offer you a good support to describe your Schrodinger equation. I'm going to try to come back to this point a bit later on. So just as a summary at this point, we started originally with this time dependent Schrodinger equation here. And then we said that we will use this bond one representation, now customized here with our multi with this multidimensional Gaussian. And what we saw is that if we now insert that in the time dependent Schrodinger equation, we obtain here this new time dependent Schrodinger equation expressed in this basis of Gaussian functions. Okay? And what we said is that we can have this Gaussian function to move, so the center of the Gaussian uh, functions to move in different ways. The one we will be interested in here is called full multiple spawning, and you will move this Gaussian classically. So how does that work? Well, the first idea here, I'm going to just do a sort of list of the different things that we're going to do for this full multiple spawning, and then I will just drive you through the different points. So first of all, this is now, this is this way we express a nuclear wave function, right, with this multidimensional Gaussian. We know that the time dependent Schrodinger equation will be replaced by this equation with the coefficients, with this C's here. What we do in full multiple spawning is that this width of the Gaussian that we described before will be fixed. So the, the width of your Gaussian are not going to change over time, they're frozen. This leads to quite some simplifications in the numerics. Doesn't change much, once more. Replacing the time-dependent width by a frozen width just means that basically we may just need more Gaussian to discover our nuclear wave function. 
What we have also here as a little customization of this representation is the fact that in the full multiple spawning, there's this spawning part. What we're going to do is that we're going to actually allow for a new Gaussian function to be created during the dynamics. How do you see that in this equation here? Well, look up here. The number of this Gaussian function is now time dependent. So it means that while doing my dynamics, I will have the possibility, if I need more Gaussians, to kind of create new Gaussian, add new Gaussian as I go. So we will move our trajectory basis function classically. And then the phase that I described earlier is also moved semi-classically. So let's get rid of this first part because it's the simple part somehow. What I just show you here is the equation of motion for the Gaussian in them, themselves, the center of the Gaussian in position and momentum space. And if you look at this equation here, you will realize that these are classical Hamilton equations of motion. Basically, my Gaussian are just evolving classically on an electronic potential energy surface. That's just what it means here, okay? So this phase that I described before, there is just a prescription how to define it, just makes the numeric simpler no need to focus too much about that. What I just want you to keep in mind is that in this full multiple spawning, we describe the nuclear wave function by this frozen Gaussian, and this Gaussian, they will just follow classical equations of motion. There's no quantum, nothing, just classical equations of motion. And we are done. That's all what has to be seen for the motion of the Gaussian. Now, we still need to talk about this time dependent Schrodinger equation, right? This equation that I described before. What are the components of this equation? The C's that you see here, this is just a vector of all the coefficients that gives you the importance of each Gaussian used to express the nuclear wave function in electronic state capital I. Okay, So it's just all the coefficients of the, all the Gaussian that you're using. This S that you see here are just so-called overlap matrix. In other words, it is just how the Gaussian K overlaps with the Gaussian K prime. Okay. Of course, if you have a high density of this Gaussian, they will all overlap. If they kind of move away, they will overlap less. This S dot is also an overlap, but now with just the time derivative. All these terms arise when you put that in the Schrodinger equation, right, from the born one representation and you shake it, right? All these terms, they appear naturally, right? You will see them appearing here. So now the big question is, how about this H here, this Hamiltonian matrix element? And this one is really the critical one, because this Hamiltonian matrix element here is the one that will allow your Gaussian function to talk to each other. All your Gaussian functions, they will be coupled. And if I'm stressing that, it's because when you will hear about surface hopping, you will also hear about the idea that in surface hopping, you represent a nuclear wave function by independent classical trajectories. All the trajectories are independent. They don't talk to each other. Here, in full multiple spawning, the Gaussians are talking to each other. And the responsible for that is this Hamiltonian. And that's why I know that you're going to hate me, because I'm going to show you the equations for that. And I'm going to drive you through it. But bear with me. It's disgusting. It looks like that, right? But what you see here is I zoomed up here on the matrix elements of this big H matrix here between the Gaussian K and K prime. So I say, look, K, K prime, you are two Gaussian. How are you talking to each other? First term is they are talking via the nuclear kinetic energy term. Then they're talking via the electronic energy. Then something that looks horrible, but now hopefully you can recognize this term here. Electronic state J, electronic state I, nuclear displacements. That's the non adiabatic coupling vector that we described earlier, right? Okay. And then we have this second order coupling here that I also described a bit before. So this Hamiltonian matrix helps you to couple this Gaussian together. Now I can just help you just to see what are the important contributions here. If I look at two Gaussian functions, K and K prime, that are on the same electronic state, okay? They will be talking here via the nuclear kinetic energy operator, the electronic energy, 
And this term here is the diagonal second order couplings that you have here. If the two Gaussian are on different states, the only term in the Hamiltonian matrix element that will survive is the term that depends on the non adiabatic coupling vectors. That makes sense. It's the one that tells you how much two electronic states are coupled, right? And the second order coupling vectors. So if you like pictures, that's exactly what I just told you, right? If you have different Gaussian functions, if the two Gaussians are on the same state, like K and M here, they will talk in the following way. Nuclear term, electronic term, ed electronic energy term, and the second order coupling. If the two Gaussians are on different states, say K and L, they will be talking via the normatic coupling vectors and the normatic coupling term here. OK? But once more, take home message is these Gaussians will be talking to each other. So it looks great, right? It looks like we have all these matrix elements. World is beautiful. We have a new method to solve the Schrodinger equation. No, we did zero progress at this stage because the method here is still exact. And I just want to quote the fact that in the context of chemistry, if the method is exact, it's by definition useless, right? So here, what is the big problem? I showed you this matrix element, right? It's cool because we can see them. We know how is the Gaussian. We know the electronic energy. But what is this matrix element? When I show you this term here, what we mean here is an integral of the full nuclear configuration space. Okay? Meaning that I need to know my Gaussian function over the full nuclear configuration space. That's okay. I have the expression. The same here for the other Gaussian. But this one here, the electronic energy depends also on the nuclear coordinates. In other words, if I wanted to calculate really this integral as it is, I need to know the electronic energy of the full configuration space. Good luck, right? <laughs> if you want to do that for a three-dimensional molecule, you will have to kind of basically scan. You will have to represent everything on the grid. <laughs> Back to problem, right? So this. In this particular case, it's problematic. It's great because you see exactly what would be the coupling. But to calculate it, well, no free lunch, right? This is a problem, OK? So for small dimensional system, you can most likely express that. But otherwise, uh, you're in trouble. Right? There's just one term you can do is the kinetic energy operator. If it's a second derivative with respect to R, everything is magical, beautiful. That's the only one you can get for free. So. Um, but otherwise, you have a problem there, OK? But you have a framework. You have a new framework. So now, how about this spawning algorithm? So spawning, verb, intransitive, that says to deposit eggs or produce spawn, like the fish, right? Uh, or to produce offspring in large numbers. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do here in the, in the spawning. So how does it work? You start here with one of these Gaussians. So that's my little symbol here for a Gaussian. And the dot here is the center of this Gaussian that will move classically. OK? So this little Gaussian here will move classically, follow down here is this potential. OK? And when you reach this region here where you have a coupling between different states, what you're going to do is to spoon a new function. What do I mean by spawn is not that the Gaussian is jumping from one state to the other, but we really create a new function, right? You create it here because you want a friend to be coupled and to play with and say, hey, you want some amplitude? Yeah, cool. OK, that's the idea here of the spawning. And you will spawn as many functions as you need to ensure a smooth transfer of amplitude from one state to the other. In other words, to describe the non-adiabatic transition properly. The spawning algorithm is really made for that. OK? But we need to find a way to create these new Gaussian functions. Because of course, if I show you this uh, very naive cartoon here, if my Gaussian says, oh, I need to have a friend, it's a bit too late, right? Because maybe it's been a long time since you enter this region where there is some strong non-von non Neumer effect. So we need to find a way to create these functions at a time where we don't need them directly. OK? And this is called the spawning algorithm. You will see it during the tutorial this afternoon, right? That's a big part of the, of the spawning, of the multiple spawning algorithm. How does that work? 
Let me try to drag you through this idea. So we have our friend the trajectory basis function here. And what we're going to do is during the dynamics of this Gaussian, the classical dynamics, at every step, you're going to look for an effective non-adiabatic coupling, a measure of the non von oppenheimer ness of your dynamics. Okay? So you can do that by looking at the amplitude of the non-adiabatic coupling vector. You can do that by looking at the non-adiabatic coupling vector scalar product velocities. There's, there's some measures of the strength of non-adiabaticity. You will define as a user, big warning, a threshold where you say, mm, if you go beyond this point, I would like you to consider to spawn a new function. Okay? And in this plot here, this is this dashed line that you see here. This dashed line is the value of the effective coupling that I set as a user. Okay? So my Gaussian that I have here will evolve here, and at every step, will measure the strength of this effective coupling. So along this trajectory, this effective coupling that the Gaussian is, is this thin blue line that you see here that peaks, where there's a minimum in energy gap here, and then goes down here. Okay, that's, that's the effective coupling that my Gaussian is going to follow at every step. So this Gaussian here will arrive here in a region, which is this blue square, where if you look down here, the effective coupling that my Gaussian feels is larger than the effective coupling that I set as a threshold. In other words, the Gaussian is arriving in a region of non-adiabaticity, and I detected it. At this point, the dynamic stops. Right? And you enter into the so-called spawning mode. You do not propagate these coefficients, like this, uh, this big C matrix. You just say, wait, we're going to see if we need another function. So in this spawning mode here, the Gaussian will carry its dynamics classically with smaller time step, so very carefully, right? And we try to detect the maximum of this effective coupling between the states. So this will be when the Gaussian reached this point here. You see, we have a maximum of this effective coupling. And at this position, you will spawn a new function. You create a clone of the parent Gaussian on the coupled state with zero amplitude. OK? Now, what do we do from there? Well, we come back in time. What we do is, from this point here, we back propagate in time, <coughs> negative time, back to the very beginning of the spawning mode. In other words, this one is coming back home, where it started. And this one here is going somewhere else, because it feels the forces from another electronic state. OK? That's the super mega key point. OK? Now, what I can do? is when they kind of went back into this entry time, I restart my dynamics. In other words, I repropagate towards the coupling region, but now solving this equation for the Cs with the new Gaussian that is there, the new friend, OK? At the beginning here, these two don't see really each other. But when they will arrive in this region, and we know they will arrive perfectly overlapping in position space, perfectly overlapping at this position here, meaning that they can really talk as much as they want when they enter the coupling region. And then they will move away. OK? So that's the spawning algorithm here. So you create this new function, and you create it at the time where you have a maximum of the coupling. You come back in time, and then you do the actual propagation where you measure how amplitudes, how these coefficients that I described to you will be exchanged between the different Gaussian functions. OK? Which, of course, is a bit of a numerical burden, because you can move forward, backward. You have to be a bit careful with this, right? But it offers you a rather robust algorithm to do that. So just as a last point related to the full multiple spawning, how do we initialize these dynamics? I said, can I ask you something? Oh, of course. <coughs> so when you create a new Gaussian, uh, which gradient is following? Is, is, so, so the Gaussian, and this is a very important thing, the Gaussian is linked to one electronic state. 
never changes. So the Gaussian always has a label of an electronic state. It always remains on this electronic state. Now, if you spawn a Gaussian, say, on a different state, then the Gaussian on the different state always follow the gradient from the other state. Okay, because in the other, in the next slide, you have like uh, you, will, you are going uphill in the graph instead. Right? Yes. Uh, so this, so this is because I mean this one. So what is kind of important to see here, here is the fact that when you when you spawn this function here, so you get also the momenta. Sorry. So you get position and momenta from the parent. Okay. So you back propagate it, but you know. You might propagate it with the gradient that you have here, but you know that they will meet again at this position. So you, you, it's not just you just you don't just drop it there, right? What you do is to really copy with the momentum, okay. so that they really meet at this point in uh, in in uh, configuration space. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. Cool. So yeah. So how do you initialize the, the spawning? So in principle. If you start from a given initial condition, so this initial nuclear wave function, you will try to find a certain number of Gaussian that you combine together, you project them on this initial state here, such that this Gaussian gives a good description of your initial nuclear wave function. Then you propagate this Gaussian, but they will already be coupled together from the time t0. Okay, so these Gaussian are here, they do like, I don't know, 20 Gaussians that are here, they talk to each other and they all have their own life as classical trajectories, but they all talk to each other via this Hamiltonian matrix, right? And then each of these Gaussians can spawn, so that's these branches that you see here, and all the branches will be connected between all the Gaussians, all the parents, everything, okay? So that's how it's working. So you will have this sort of tree of Gaussian being formed there, okay? Uh, when you spawn the, the Gaussians, yeah. you will spawn all of them, or you can just spawn. Uh... So it's really an individual process. Okay. So so it, it's really oh this Gaussian needed oh. so when you start to have a lot of Gaussian, that's exactly what happens, right? You just have one Gaussian spawn a new one, then next step oh no the other one wants to spawn now. So you spend your life doing spawning modes, right? So that's that's right. but, yeah 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 exactly. You see your input file like okay now do some oh no. Because in your input file, you see the progression of the dynamics, then it stops. <laughs> it carries on, comes back, carries on. You, you will see it. It's frustrating. And when you start to have 20 of these Gaussian, and this I'm going to mention it after, you will need to kind of care about the fact that they're talking to each other. So it's not just 20 individual Gaussian. You need to kind of calculate some intermediate stuff. But this, I'm going to be the head of myself. So I'm going to just carry on on, 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 on that here. <coughs> That's the big summary. Full multiple spooling. We use this ansatz that here, frozen Gaussian, they evolve classically. We have a number of trajectory basis function that evolves over time, okay? Um, uh, that's the spawning algorithm. And if you were to use a large enough number of this trajectory basis function, in principle, you should be able to reach a numerically exact solution of the Schrodinger equation, which means that it's not going to be very useful for molecular system. So we need to find an alternative to simulate the dynamics of molecules. And this is when we move from the big framework of the full multiple spawning to the ab initio multiple spawning, where we're going to do some key approximations on the equations that you've seen here, which is perfect for a two-minute break. OK? <laughs> okay? Just recover a bit of brain. I'm going to give three minutes. We are perfectly on time. So just keep <laughs>
And then when they will approach each other, if they overlap allows, if the non-abatic coupling allows, right, they can start to talk to each other and have exchange of amplitude between these coefficients. Okay? So they can do it. Of course, you, you expect that a lot is going to happen uh, at the maximum of this coupling here. But the, the way you measure this coupling is, a, is an effective coupling. It's not the actual coupling that the two Gaussian will have together, right? It's just a sort of a measure of this going to be important at this point. So as you said, it's likely that you will start to have some transfer of amplitude way before that. Yeah. Do we have other? Yeah, do you have another question? Yeah, um, because you were saying that the Gaussian will move uh, just uh, following a classical trajectory. Yes. In this case, the, the parameters for the potential and the surface is going to be a force field, something like a force field, or? I haven't mentioned that at the moment. So in principle, at the moment, I've been considering that we have the electronic energies, okay. And I have the forces to kind of move my, 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 trajectory, my trajectory classically. We're going to see now how we actually make it into the real world, right? But yeah, at the moment, I was just considering that I have all the ingredients that I, that I need to propagate the trajectories classically on the potential energy surfaces. In other words, the electronic energies and the nuclear forces from that. Yeah. And uh, if I want to uh, plug it away, uh, what <laughs> Killer question. <laughs> so, so uh, <laughs> the thing that is very important to see here is that when you have this classical trajectory perspective, the classical terms is just how your basis functions are moving. Okay. In other words, if you have enough of this classical Gaussian to describe your system well, then you don't really care about the zero point energy concept here. Because what will matter is the nuclear wave function that you will reconstruct by adding the coefficients and the Gaussian. And if the Gaussian are describing well the region where you are, your nuclear wave function is going to be described properly, right? The corollary to your question is actually if the Gaussians are moving classically, how to make sure that they really spread the space that you need, right? And this is possibly a problem. This is why we need to spawn, for example, is to make sure that we have more functions. For example, tunneling. So this is one of the killer, right? Because of course, classical trajectories will evolve, but you cannot really tunnel. So formally, the equations for the coefficients could describe tunneling, but you would need to have Gaussians along this tunneling path to describe that. So there are strategies to spawn function through a barrier, right? So Tom Martin has played with that in 2000. It's, it's, not really, it's not really the purpose of the spawning. If you have to do that, well, I would advise you to use VMCG, which this VMCG was this quantum trajectory based Gaussian. So those ones, they will do it, right? So if you want, the zero point energy is not per se a problem here for full multiple spawning because it's not really the classical trajectory, the object of interest. The classical trajectories are just a way to have your Gaussian around. The object of interest is what you reconstruct from this basis. And that's a different philosophy from surface hopping, where surface hopping, the trajectories themselves are the quantities of interest. OK? Now, of course, all what I'm telling you is going to go to the drain <laughs> when I go to the, no, not everything. But in the Avinitio multiple spawning, we have, of course, you will see like less trajectories around. So it's harder to kind of build the confidence that you have enough Gaussians to describe really all these fine aspects, right, for zero point energy and these kind of things. Do, do you see this, uh, this part? <laughs> I think, okay, <laughs> yeah, just, just shout in case. But so I think the, the, the really big, big point here is the fact that even if this Gaussian moves classically, at the end of the day, if you think of Gaussian that are moving classically, but you have enough Gaussian to really describe well your nuclear wave function, you don't care the way they move. You can even freeze them. That's called a grid, right? And it's still correct. So the only thing is that, of course, this assumption of you have enough Gaussian to describe your process is going to be the one where we lead to do the drawback. That's going to be if you want our compromise to kind of look at larger systems, right? OK? So classical trajectories, yes, but just move the basis function, because the actual nuclear 
equations of motion are still quantum. They are evolved on the support of these Gaussians. Okay, it's just this. It, it, it's just this kind of mental trick right here to kind of go go to. In particular, if if you know surface hopping and you think surface hopping for this kind of stuff, so that's uh, that's a bit different. Okay, yes. Uh, a really silly question. So, for example, what we do when we study spectroscopy at the university, we have let's say that the ground electronic state, and then we have some by the vibrational uh, nuclear uh, state associated with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the line lines for the other uh, electronic excited states. So how does that language translate from that point to this point? Because here we, for example, you are solving the TDSE for, I don't know, a, a single nuclear wave function. Oh, I don't know if you have the problem, but how, how do you uh, that, that mm -hmm. translate it? Yeah. Idea? So, I mean, the thing is that you really have, and that was actually, that's actually an amazing paper by Heller, which is the time dependence perspective to spectroscopy. So in spectroscopy, you can really always revert back from the time independent and the time dependent perspective. You can calculate from condon resolved spectra, so vibronic spectra, by propagating wave packets. You propagate wave packets, you calculate autocorrelation function, you get out of that vibronically resolved spectra. There is a correspondence between these two worlds. So when I see a nuclear wave packet, everything is in the term. Why packet? Because a nuclear wave packet is an object that I can represent as a linear combination of nuclear eigenstates with a coefficient that depends on time in front. So in other words, if you give me the nuclear eigenstate here, I translate my full multiple spawning wave function as a linear combination with coefficient of this time independent nuclear eigenstate. No problem. I mean, the problem would be for you to give me these states in the first place. So, 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 so that's the important thing is that formally there is an absolute correspondence between these two worlds, right? And for some properties, it's simpler to use the time dependent case. For some other properties, the time independent. So the idea of using time dependent propagations to calculate spectra came when calculating a lot of front condon factors and these kind of things for large molecular systems. I mean, you have tons of ones, it becomes like just crazy. The number of things that you have to calculate, right? Well, if you have the potential and if you can do the quantum dynamics on that, it comes really naturally out of the calculation. It's actually a beautiful thing in quantum dynamics is to calculate the spectra fully resolved just by doing the dynamics and the autocorrelation of this function. It's, it's, it's crazy, and you get you, but you can do it. Actually, I will I will aim at that at uh, I will hint at that like um, uh, later on when I show you uh, something. But just to say, the two are exactly the same this this mapping i advise you to look at this uh, pa this paper by Heller. i can give you the reference because everything is kind of nicely described there but you can really map the two world and and really if you give me a basis of nuclear eigenstates for the different electronic states i can rewrite my nuclear wave packet as a combination of this static eigenstate with a different coefficients and then i can tell you well my nuclear wave packet is composed of 90% of V equal 1. That's not going to be a nice wave packet, but OK. It, it, like 20% of V equal 1, 30% of V equal 2, and so on, right? So they are completely consistent here. And you can really calculate observable in the same way. OK? Cool. Any other questions while we're here? No? Do you still remember what full multiple spawning is? Yeah? Fine. OK. So. Let's make it like now something applicable for molecular system. So how are we going to do that? Huh? Huh. If you move to this happily show multiple spawning, OK? And there's not going to be many more steps. There are basically two main approximations to get from the full multiple spawning to the happily show multiple spawning. The first one is an approximation that is called the subtle point approximation of order 0. In other words, it will be uh, an approximation on this matrix element that we've seen before, this Hamiltonian matrix element that coupled two different Gaussians. The other approximation we're going to do is called the independent first generation approximation, and it will be related to the way we initialize the full multiple, the ab initial multiple spawning dynamics. Okay? Basically, all of this approximation will be related to the coupling between the Gaussians. Okay? So let's have a look at that. Do you remember this equation here that I wrote before? 
this big, big, big problem that we have here. So if you want to construct this Hamiltonian matrix element, you will need to calculate matrix elements that look like that. These are integrals over the full nuclear configuration space, which in one dimension is perhaps easy. You can calculate electronic energy along one dimension. But now if you have a three N dimensional system, you will have massive problems here. How are we gonna solve this problem? I mean, we're not gonna solve it, we're gonna approximate this, okay? So what we're gonna do when we look at a coupling between a Gauss and K and M is to define the centroid position, basically the center between these two Gauss M, okay? Which is this position here. Then at this position, I am gonna calculate the electronic quantity of interest, here this electronic energy, as a Taylor expansion, okay? So the electronic energy is the electronic energy at the centroid position. So I calculate the electronic energy here, right? EDFT, KSSCI, whatever, okay? You calculate this energy. Then you can add a first order term that depends here on the nuclear gradient of this energy, plus another order term, which is now related to the second derivative, so the Hessian of this, and so on, and so on, and so on. You do a Taylor expansion, right? And this is supposed to give you a representation of the shape of the electronic energy around the centroid position. Now comes the dirty trick. The thing is that as my Gaussians are quite localized, I will consider that I can actually approximate this electronic energy at the, the centroid position by just the zero order term. Okay? So I remove everything else. What does it mean? It means that I will consider that my electronic energy is constant here over the kind of spread of my two Gaussian. Massive approximation, if you think, okay? So if you want a drawing of that, I hope it's helpful. So this will be the true picture where you have this electronic energy here in gray that changes like that. I have my two Gaussian, I have my centroid position here in between. So if you do the saddle point approximation of order zero, it's like saying that this curve here can be approximated by a constant electronic energy over the spread of these two Gaussian. If I were to add the first order term that depends on the gradients, then I would have a linear approximation here for my potential energy surface. But I will need to calculate the gradient. OK? So in the spawning algorithm, I mean, sorry, in the ab initio multiple spawning, we use a zero order approximation for this matrix element. But there, that is absolutely amazing from a computational perspective. Because now, if we use this saddle point approximation of order zero here, and also what we're going to do in general in ab initio multiple spawning is to get rid of the second order couplings, that's a Completely different discussion. If you want some references, you can check this, uh, this, this paper here discussing that. But what we end up having now for this matrix element coupling K and K prime is now the term that depends on the electronic energy looks like that. Because do you remember we had the electronic energy sandwiched by the two Gaussian? Now, if I do this saddle point approximation of order zero, the electronic energy does not depend anymore on capital R. I can take it out from the integral which is what I did here. This term is now outside of the integral. And I just have now an overlap that is super easy to calculate. Same thing for the non elevated coupling vector. Do you remember? They were sandwiched in this gigantic term. But now if I just evaluate them at the centroid position, they do not depend on capital R anymore. I can take them out from the integral here. And that's so much simpler. So what does that mean? It means that I can take this Gaussian now, and I can propagate that, say, with ab initio molecular dynamics using the electronic structure method that you want, CDTFT, KSSCS, XMS, PT2, ADC2, you name it, okay? You propagate this Gaussian, and when you have to calculate a matrix element like this one here, the only thing that you need to do is for each pair of Gaussian to calculate at the centroid position another electronic structure calculation. The electronic energy or the non abatic coupling vectors, depending on whether the Gaussian are on the same state or on different states. This is enough to build 
the Hamilton and metrics element. But you need to do an extra electronic social calculation. That's the no free lunch of having this Gaussian to be coupled, right? So this here means that now this is the equation that I have for my Hamilton matrix element. In principle, this will scale quadratically with the, the number of electronic structure calculation per time step will scale quadratically n times n plus one divided by two, because I need to kind of, for each pair of Gaussian functions, I need to calculate now the centroid and the electronic information at the centroid position. However, as they are Gaussian, and as we have a term like that, which is just the overlap of the Gaussian in front, I can use that to inform me whether I should calculate this term or not. If the overlap between two Gaussian is extremely small, well, why bother? I set this matrix element to zero, okay? So overall, we achieved near linear scaling, but it's, you still need, for most cases, for the important couplings to kind of calculate this centroid uh, electronic social calculation. So you need to kind of have an extra layer of calculation here, okay? But at least you can see now how we can turn it into an ab initio scheme. Because instead of now having to calculate the electronic energy everywhere to calculate these matrix elements, we just need to know an extra information at the centroid position between the Gauss. The second approximation is related to this way of initializing the dynamics. Do you remember I told you, you take a certain number of Gaussian that are meant to represent a nuclear wave function, and all these parent trajectory basis function will be coupled from time t0. What we do in the ab initio multiple spawning is to consider that if you are looking at a multidimensional system, and if you create this wave packet at time t0, the first thing that will happen is that this wave packet is gonna spread. In other words, the coupling between this parent Gaussian is gonna decay very rapidly in the early stage of the dynamics. And this is possibly true for multidimensional system. So what we do in the ab initio multiple spawning is to consider each of these parent Gaussian independently. It means that I take a first Gaussian, just one, I let it run, it can spawn, and all these spawning functions are gonna be coupled to each other, but they won't be coupled to another parent that I run independently and that can spawn independently. You see this, that, the, uh, this dashed line that was symbolizing the coupling between them now? So that was the original scheme. In the new scheme here, only the, the Gaussian within a certain branch are coupled to each other which is also a very nice trick because it means that now I can start my trajectories with just one whoops, with just one Gaussian here. So I start, get my initial condition, start my ab initio MD, and I can spawn new functions, but this will be independent from say another initial condition that I can launch. And you will see that in the tutorial, we're gonna do exactly that. We're gonna start from one initial condition, one Gaussian, that we just travel and find its way, spawn some more functions. Then we can take another Gaussian, do the same. And then after, what you do is to basically take all the information that you can average to get the average quantities that should represent a nuclear wave packet. Okay? So the ab initio multiple spawning, it's still solving this equation, but now we dramatically simplify this Hamiltonian matrix element by using this other point approximation. And we use this independent first generation too. Then what you can do is that, of course, you can play with these equations, and there have been like different developments around that. You can have, for example, the effect of spin orbit coupling if you want to look at internal conversion and intersystem crossings. You can add the effect of an external field if you want, for example, to start dynamics from the ground state, come with a pulse, excite your molecule, so you spawn up if you want, thanks to the action of a laser pulse, right? And also, more recently, um, there have been some development trying to find a way to make the calculation cheaper. Because I'm not going to lie to you, the problem of the spawning is that your molecule goes, your dynamics goes well, you have like, tons of steps accumulating, whatever, and then suddenly you start to spawn a lot, right? So it's spawn, 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 spawn. And as, for example, if you have 20 Gaussian function, as we have this quadratic scaling that I mentioned to you, formally, to do one time step, you don't do 20 calculations, right? you are closer to 200 calculations in this particular case. So that starts to be really annoying. And a lot of the time, these Gaussian are not very strongly coupled. So you can find strategies to decouple them. And that's here 
what has been uh, what, what is proposed in the strategy to kind of almost reach the cost of a surface open in this particular case. Okay, but hang on a minute, because now there is something that we can do that is pretty cool, right? I told you that I can actually put my finger on the approximation that we are doing here. So if I take an AIMS calculation, can I match it to a numerically exact solution of the Schrodinger equation? So in other words, here what we said is we have quantum dynamics. We use this limited number of Gaussian basis function that was our full multiple spawning. Then we did this independent first generation approximation. And here we went for the saddle point of order zero, which takes us to this ab initio multiple spawning, right? Can we go backward? Can we go backward and check that actually we get to the quantum dynamics result? So that was something that we really wanted to do to sleep better at night, right? Because a plot like that is nice, but it's kind of nice to do it. So as it is like related to exact quantum dynamics, it's a one-dimensional example. But this dynamic is the lithium hydride case. So what you have here is a ground state potential energy curve. And here you have the first exciter states. This, the dashed line, is the non adiabatic coupling term. But in this particular case, we're not really going to look at the non adiabatic process, but instead we're going to really look at the dynamics of the nuclear wave function and how they talk to each other, because that's the actual core of the spawning, right? And, 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 and how these Gaussians are talking to each other. So what we're going to do is to start the dynamics here on, in the ground state, come with a very, very, very short first of flight that will promote a tiny bit of, of population. And then we're going to see how these two wave functions are talking to each other as the Gaussian, I mean, as the, the wave packet that is on the upper state moves on this S1 potential, right? So you excite here. This, you will have a part of your wave function and only a part that goes on the excited state. And this one will start to move back and forth. How can we trace that? What you can do is to calculate here this time dependent dipole moment, which is the expectation value here of the dipole moment operator. And psi here is my full molecular wave function that I can produce from the spawning. Do you remember this Paul Wong representation? I can always write a molecular wave function out of this, the multiple spawning uh, uh, equation. This quantity, to come back to your question, is basically the quantity that you can Fourier transform to obtain biorganically resolved electronic spectra. So how does it look like? So what you have here is time. This is the dipole moment. And what you see here is this oscillation of the dipole moment. The gray area that you see here is the time of the laser pulse. The oscillation that you see are not caused by the laser pulse. They are caused by the fact that you have a molecule in the ground state. You come with a very short burst of light. A bit of the molecule goes on the excited states, but there's still something on the ground state. And they are co coherently talking to each other. This is called a transient electronic wave packet, if you want. But these two nuclear wave functions are talking to each other. And then the one on the upper state starts to leave the franc region, meaning that the overlap between these two start to decay. This is what you see here. You see these oscillations start to decay. This is when the wave packet on the upper state starts to leave. So this is actually called quantum beating. And it encodes the information about the vibrational state. So if you fully transform that, you will actually see the vibrational progression that is related to the vibrational state on this potential and on this potential. So if you look at the red line, this is exact quantum dynamics. Blue line is ab initio multiple spawning. The XF is just because we use an external field. Don't worry about that, OK? So what you can see is that, I mean, we were quite happy because this is the worst case scenario for the ab initio multiple spawning. This independent first generation approximation is really bad for low dimensional system because, of course, you don't have the spreading of your wave packet as fast as in multidimensional system. So we we're quite happy to see that. Okay, but now what we can do is to actually start to climb up and remove the approximation one after the other. Okay, so first thing that we can do is to remove this independent first generation approximation. So what we do is to start on the ground state with nine of this trajectory basis function, right? And what you can see here uh, is that this gray line 
is doing a bit better here, right? We have a bit better the discussion of the amplitude, but then starts to get quite mental at a later time. This is the moment where the wave packet on the upper scale starts to move away. This is where the subtle point approximation is going to be suffering, right? Because now we have basically things that are not really in the same position. So let's go one order more in the subtle point order. Let's go to the subtle point approximation of order one. So that's the so that's the subtle point approximation of order zero. So that's just the reason that I showed you before. If we add the other one, you see how it starts to align better, right? Order two, order three, order four. And as the system is simple, I can numerically integrate that and get the limit of the full multiple spot. Okay? That's pretty neat. But if you want to be precise, you can still be annoyed by this part here where you don't have a perfect agreement with the exact quantum dynamics result. And the reason here is because I am only using 18 Gaussian functions for that. So I will need more functions to come back to the point, right, to really properly describe the Gaussian wave packet. So you can do that by adding some, some additional Gaussian on the upper part, uh, which kind of now you have, you, you need to do it also on the ground state, but you can see that you basically now get the oscillation rates properly here. So with that, this is the kind of cool stuff with the spawning. That you know where your approximations are. Of course, you can do that for a molecular system, right? A full molecular system. But at least you know how you can connect the initial multiple spawning to the quantum dynamics, okay? And you can this, so this was done really with the initial multiple spawning code that you will be using, right? It's not a specially made code. It's the one that you're gonna use it today, just where we included more order in the subtle point approximation, okay? Great. I propose just to kind of drive you through a few steps. We're almost at the end, just to kind of show you how, I mean, the kind of calculation that we can do. So there have been quite a lot of molecules that have been done with the ab initial multiple spawning. Uh, I selected just a few, few of them, a few examples. I think that I added a few more slides after, at the end of this lecture, just to kind of show you a few more um, uh, information for if, you, if you want more examples, right? So the first example here is about this molecule here, which is a five atom molecule called sulfide. Very simple little molecule. And what they observe experimentally, this was in 2010, is that if you take this molecule and you shine some light on it, you can form this cyclic carbon sulfur oxygen oxathirane molecule, which is a very weird molecule. Actually, the title of this paper is oxathirane. So apparently for synthetic chemists, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. But where we were kind of interested is to see that you have tons of other molecules that are formed. In particular, some with carbon triple bond sulfur, which is weird, right? So this reaction here generated a lot of molecules, and we were wondering, how come? Do you have like 20,000 conical intersections on the excited states for different photo products? So what we did is to do the ab initial multiple spawning with msk 2 Yeah, the molecule is small, we can really go for it, right? That's a quite high level of electronic structure. And we looked at both the ground, the excited and the ground state dynamics. So what did we observe? So this is a typical plot. Uh, maybe you're going to try to plot one like that during the practical, where you have the population of an electronic states over time here. So you see this, dash, this dotted line that you have here is the population of the first excited state, which is the one that you reach in the experiment. And what you see is that it starts at one and it decays here within roughly one picosecond. In other words, the molecule is fully on the first excited state, and we see one because the one comes back towards the ground state. Okay? Now, if you look at the other curves here, this is the molecules. We can really look at the molecules that are formed during this process. And what you see is that basically on the ground state, you reform 60% of this name here, which is the original parent molecule, the parent sulfide and 20% of this oxide theory, which is this carbon sulfur oxygen, so the weird molecule if you want. In other words, when you excite this molecule, the only thing we see from the excited state dynamics is the molecule relaxing, reforming the parent molecule or forming this one. Nothing else in the excited state. Just like, okay, well, <laughs> you check your electronic structure, you just make sure, like, where are the other molecules, right? And then you start to think that this little scheme that I showed you at the beginning is maybe short-sighted. 
Because it's maybe not just this part that is important, but also what is happening after the molecule comes back on the ground state. Because the molecule is boiling hot, right? It has tons of energies, right? Because you injected all these energies here, so it will relax and do a lot of things on the ground state. And that's actually exactly what happens with this molecule. The photoproducts are not formed on the excited state. They are formed on the ground state. But they are formed because you put a lot of energy with a photon, right? So this is a crowded plot because we have tons of molecules. But what you see here is the time after the, molecule, the, the wave packet comes back on the ground state. So it goes from 0 to 3 picosecond. And this is the population of the different molecules. So this line here is the parent sulfide. This line here is a family of molecules that contains this oxide tyrene here. These are the acidic molecule, and you have dissociated molecule. We did the simulation with and without the argon matrix, just to be sure. But basically here, what we observe is that after three picoseconds, all the molecules that were in the paper are there. They are just formed on the ground state. Which is kind of cool for a photo product, right? So the picture can be quite simple. You have the sulfine. You pump energy on the molecule. It goes back on the ground state from oxacetylene and sulfine, but on steroids, right? And this might be enough to actually form all the other molecules that we observe in the, in the paper. However, here there is a caveat. It's the fact that if we were to look at the energy that these molecules have when they go back on the ground state, and the buyer to form all these products, this will take a nanosecond. We observe that only in a few picosecond. And the reason for that is that when you come back from the excited states, the energy that you have in a different mode is not distributed like if you have hated your system. It is distributed in specific modes. Over time, this energy will redistribute via IVR. So in, uh, that, I mean, the, the energy will distribute in the different modes and go back family. But in the early stage of the dynamics, you can inject energies in specific modes that will trigger the formation of this molecule much faster than if you were to kind of calculate that from transition state theory, considering that the ensemble is just hot. OK? So that's actually quite nice, because it came naturally from the calculation here. And some experiment after that on different families of molecules related to this one kind of point towards this very fast formation of the photoproducts on the ground state. So if you want to go for larger molecular system, because I just showed you a five atom molecule, so you can still laugh at me, um, what we can do is actually turn towards um, uh, the ability of multiple spawning, now interface with an electronic structure code that can use GPUs, graphic cards. Okay? And in this particular, we played with Terrakem, which is also developed by Tom Martinez. So the good thing of this, of this uh, software is the fact that you can do some electronic structure calculation super efficient. State of HCS CF, TDDFT on GPU is very efficient when you look at systems of, say, 20, 30 to hundreds of atoms. Okay? So, with this in hand, what we can look at now is actually the ring of opening of pro vitamin D, which forms pre vitamin D and vitamin B. Okay, so pro vitamin D is the molecule we'll be interested in. It's basically at the core a cyclohexadiene with decorations around, right? Which ring up in here to form this hexa triad. But that starts to be a bit bigger, right? So this is actually a 51 atom molecule. And what happens is that you have the front condom point here and you excite on the first excited states here. This first example state can have an interplay with S2 and go back to a conical intersection, which is shown here. And this conical intersection can take you back either as a ring close or as a ring open form of the molecule. Okay? So the state of HKCF that we use here for this calculation, we've checked it that it reproduces all the features of the MSKSPD2. So the energies of the different points that you have here, but also the shape of the conical intersections. It's actually a quite magical active space uh, in, in this particular case. And we run, we started with 30 initial Gaussians that will create over the two picosecond time scale of this dynamics, 
more than 330 Gaussian function. Okay, that starts to be quite heavy. So on GPU, one step of this calculation at the time, so that was not the, the nice GPU I showed you before, but that was a bit older GPUs, like in the, I think they were in the 70s. But um, so this is this calculation that we should have been done on a couple of GPUs only. And for one step, it takes two minutes. If you do the same thing in more pro, it takes you two hours. For one step of one Gaussian, okay? So that's the kind of speed up that you can get in this particular case. So what we observe is again, electronic population versus time. You excite this S1 state here, so this blue curve here, and these blue curves as a, as a characteristic by exponential decay here. <coughs> if you fight this by exponential decay, so you have here the, 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 light, the, the time for the by exponential decay and the amplitudes, it actually fits what has been observed, the range observed experimentally here. And we could explain that by the fact that originally the wave packet gets very fast towards the intersection, which will lead to this first addition depopulation here. But then it starts to spread on the first excited states and only very progressively reaches again the intersection scene, meaning that the processes to go back after this first really efficient <coughs> process is much slower. So we were quite happy. There was a toy. We just wanted to do something big with GPU. Let's face it, right? Uh, but the good thing is that actually some experiment that is used just after this, um, this research to look at this molecule here, but now using a transient absorption spectroscopy and could use this sort of explanation of the bi-exponential decay to fit their data. And the model fitted quite nicely with what they observed. So that's kind of the, the little sugar on top, right? It's the fact that actually, when you kind of start now to be able to kind of provide things that can be useful for experimentalists, that's quite interesting. And that's one part that I don't have time to talk today about, but which is the importance of actually not just calculating this kind of plus <laughs> that I showed you. This plus that you have here with population of electronic states is not something per se that experimentalists can calculate. Electronic states are not an experimental measurable per se. What you always need to do is to try to kind of then go back to the molecular wave function and to calculate expectation values that can be observed experimentally. So for example, like traces time, time result photoelectron spectra or transient absorption spectra. And in the other example that I gave you in the lecture notes after my take home message, there is an example of calculating time result quantities. But this is really one thing that we to kind of keep in mind is that this method here is very interesting because you can actually calculate experimental quantities and compare it directly with experiments. Okay. So take home message. So this full multiple spooling is an in principle exact framework with the idea that you want to do excited state dynamics by looking at the nuclear wave function with a swarm of coupled trajectory basis function that evolve along classical trajectories. And then number can be adapted as you need, in particular in the region of neuropathicity. Now, to make it tractable for molecular system, we move to the ab initial multiple spawning, where you have these two approximations, the saddle point approximation and the independent first generation approximation. It's basically the coupling between the Gaussian. So you can put your finger on the approximations that you are doing here, but it allows you to do on the fly ab initial dynamics. And we're going to have an example during the tutorial this afternoon. You can simulate small to medium-sized molecular system, but there is also no free lunch in a sense that in surface hopping, you accept a big approximation as a swarm of independent classical trajectories, meaning that when you want to do the analysis of this result, you just count your trajectories. In the spawning, you have to keep in mind that a trajectory is not the actual result. What is the result is the coefficients on the support of this trajectory, and you need to kind of rebuild all the important observable from these quantities. Once more, hopefully this will come clear during the tutorial this afternoon. But it means that it takes a tiny bit more brain and effort and energy to actually get something out of the uh, output of, uh, of the spawning. But it is a method that is ever evolving. There are a lot of really interesting developments in, in, in this field and in the more general field of using Gaussian functions. And, um, and uh, also like just the idea of trying to lower the buyer for new users, because it's very clear that with this method, it's 
it's a bit less it's a bit less simple to kind of just give it a try as in service of it. So my main take home message is that if you are interested in this method and you just want to kind of use it in any context, feel free to contact me anytime. I'm always super happy to kind of get you started or kind of just like look at the different uh, things together. We're going to have the, the tutorial this afternoon. Hopefully, we'll give you a first idea. We're going to use more pro. The full multiple spawning is implemented in more pro. So it's there in the package. So you can have a go with that. And with this, uh, yeah, so you have this uh, overview of thermodynamic <laughs> dynamics. I think that's one of the papers that I gave you. It gives you just a sort of idea from the born one perspective, also this exact factorization that I mentioned, and connects to the different method that I discussed um, today, if you are interested. But with that, thank you very much for your attention. Shout them otherwise at the coffee break anytime. I'll be around the entire day, so uh, feel free to kind of call me at any time if you want to ask anything. Okay, one, I think one thing uh, the, the slides and the, the papers uh, are already in the Dropbox uh, folder that I send the link uh, on Sunday. I think. Okay. Good, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.